Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, as you can see, I've got this colorful tire on. It basically represents a government of the people, by the people, and for the people in these United States. Well, guess what? We're, we're going to be in the process here for the next three or four months now, well, for the next year or so, uh, to basically elect our leadership. Very, 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 very important. So I would say and I would suggest to you the first thing that you need to do is to make sure you are eligible to vote for one of these individuals. Very, very, very important. Because too often what normally happens is that you don't vote, some of us don't vote, and then, then now all of a sudden we want to get engaged. Well, it's too late then. If you, once the leadership is selected, then you work with that person. Whether you voted for the person or you don't vote for the person, get your issues to the table. Very important. These folks are knocking on the doors. They're sending you literature and the like. And so there are some tools that are sort of nonpartisan. It's like the voter's guide, if you will. That comes closest, if you will, uh, to be able to look at the person that's just in a nonpartisan view. And uh, I would suggest that you look at those. And uh, as you note, we are, by, we are sort of a mail, from the state of Oregon, we're a mail-in ballot type of a situation. So you get those at home. I would suggest you get together with folks and get around the round table and, and talk about the issues and look at shows like us, like I'm getting ready, we're getting ready to do today and, and get a better feel of who these candidates are, et cetera, et cetera. You got national, uh, you got the gubernatorial, you got the presidential, you got a whole bunch of stuff. But anyway, like I said, the Oregon Voters Digest is going to be very involved during this period, this election period, and we're going to give every opportunity for you to meet the candidates here within the Oregon area, because that's where we want to focus, and again, more specifically, in the Portland metropolitan area. So welcome aboard, and like I said, uh, pay attention, get involved, very, very important, get involved, listen to what's going on, and ask the question of these people who are potentially leaders. They're going to be speaking for us. Now, all of a sudden, it'll be, quote, it will be an election of, of not of the people, by the people, and for the people, by a one person who will represent of the people, by the people, and for the people. you got to remember that. Once you've elected that person, you got to work with that person. Before that, it is a government of the people, but it still is after the fact, but you got one representative representing us, okay? Well, we're starting off today with, I think we're going to be very exciting. Again, we're talking about the state of Oregon, and, and too often here in the metropolitan Portland area, uh, we tend to segregate ourselves, if you will, from the from the other parts of the of the state. And so it's very, very important. So what I did, I, I went out and got a non-politician, someone that I felt that uh, wasn't an incumbent, but someone that was, that, was, that was interested in getting his issues out on the table, but also responding to the issues that he was hearing from other people. And I, I'm, I'm talking about Bruce Cuff. Bruce Cuff is running for governor of the state of Oregon. He was on the show, the, I think it was about a week or so ago, and, and I had Richard, Richard, by the way, is also doing the co-host with me today. But we had him on the other day, but we thought it would be very, very neat to have him on this point in time because we've been having issues in the state and up in Burns and whatever. And, and Rich, I mean, uh, uh, Bruce is going to get involved a bit more about uh, giving us an update on that. And then there's been some things that have been happening in the legislature. We've been having a special session. And then there's been some very interesting things like um, uh, wage uh, uh, increase and this, that, and the other. And so there's some things about that part. Locally, we've been talking about uh, we've got some major issues with homeless in this area. We've got police issues and things of that nature. But, but today we're going to give we're going to give Bruce Cuff the opportunity to share with us some things about the legislature from an update, Burns, and what that issue was all about, and uh, what was he hearing when he was knocking on doors uh, out in the state, uh, talking about the blue in his area. And at the same time, we want to make sure that. And that's what we're doing here in the metropolitan area. We want to share with him some of the concerns that we're having. And I, I really appreciate the fact that Bruce is outreaching to us and because it's very, very, very important that uh, uh, because the state is not just uh, uh, Multnomah County or Portland. There are all sorts of, I mean, I don't know how many counties we have. We have 30, 30, I mean, 36. 36 oh. counties, you know what I mean? And we're representing actually three, Washington County, uh, Clackamas County, and Multnomah County primarily. But uh, we got the, we got a whole bunch of folks out there. So anyway, welcome aboard, Bruce. Good to be here. Thanks good, good. for having Rich, me, Bruce. Rich yep. is there. You know Rich. Rich yes. is going to be right there. And, and all we're going to do, we're going to listen to what you have to say. And then every so often, Rich might pop up with something and ask you a question or whatever. But the whole point, is, as we said, as, I, as, as we introduced this whole piece, the idea is that uh, we're the people now. 
and uh, and you're wanting to represent us. That's right. right. Yes. Okay. And so once you get elected, we want you to do the job, and all we, that's, that's that's all we want. That's all we're asking. We're not looking for a special interest trying to control you totally. And even though, don't get me wrong, uh, it's always been said that the, when you think about the, the legislature, there's always the third house. And, you know, they call them lobbyists, if you will. Mm -hmm. But in all due respect, they represent business or some, sometimes uh, nonprofit groups and things of that nature. But, but the bulk of the people, a lot of times, are not really represented. And that's why today I think people are right, really frustrated. So mm -hmm. maybe because of the times that we're in to right point in time now, we need to get back down to the basics and say it is a government, a truly a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That's right. With that, why don't you introduce yourself and kind of give them a, just on, a, on the front side, again, even though it's repetitiveness, who Bruce Cuff is, uh, uh, your family, uh, how you got to Oregon, and uh, just a little background on yourself and, how do you, and why you're running for office. Okay. Well, I'm Bruce Cuff, and I, I uh, live in Mahama, Oregon. My wife and I, uh, Vonna, we've been married uh, 34 years. And uh, we have f four children and three grandchildren. Um, and I've, the last 15 years, I've been a real estate agent out of, out of the Salem area. And uh, I was born in Salem and went to uh, Brooks grade school, Jervis High School. So, um, you know, it's a rural community, but... Um, it was back in the day when you could actually work in the in the fields, and uh, so it was a good it was a good growing up. And my dad was uh, a barber in the Hayesville and Brooks area from uh, about 1958 until 2000, when he retired uh, from barbering. And I'll tell you, the barber shop is the place where, and the beauty, barber shops and beauty salons, those are the places where of the people, by the people, for the people, they have discussions, yes. you know, and that's where you can actually find out what, what people really think about what's going on. And a lot of common sense ideas are kicked around in those locations. And that's what I'd like to do. And I, beauty I, shops, too. Don't you forget bet, the beauty, beauty shops, shops barber yeah. shops. I mean, we're talking all those kind of services, yeah. tanning salons, mm -hmm. uh, nail houses, you know. I mean, it, anywhere people go where they, they congregate together and they, they share, they talk about, you know, the, the politics and religion and, and the things that are really important to them, that they'll bring them up in those kind of settings. So, and that's kind of where I kind of learned my common sense on, on things that we, that would work for the, for the state of Oregon. And uh, two years ago, I ran for governor. And one of the things that I did is I focused on, I, I went to a lot of rural Oregon, and this time I'm going to focus on uh, some of the metropolitan areas, but I went to a lot of barbershops, beauty salons wow. all across the state, got the cards, been working on a database. And, and basically what I said to the folks is, you know, the lobbyists and the special interests, those are the only people that the legislature hear from a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to develop barbershops and beauty salons in every single one of these districts, you know, where a, a representative or senator, when they're looking at legislation, they want to know what, you know, what the people actually think. They can they can call these folks up and say and hey, senior citizen centers too. You bet, like, like Richard and I. I mean, we we we. Well, you we, get your you get your hair cut still, right? Uh, well, yeah. Well, sometimes we want you to come out <laughs> in our environment, right? Yeah. right, Rich. Right. You bet. But I mean, those are the those Good. are the types okay. of places where Makes people congregate. You know, you want to get what the people actually think, not yeah. just the special interests yes, or lobbyists. Right. You're gonna you're gonna find that out because they're gonna show up at the door of the legislature. But you got to get outside the bubble down there in the Capitol. And um, you, and you got to be able to talk to each other, you know. You're not anti-business anymore. No, like no, okay, okay. no, no. I'm not. I'm not. In There's fact, inclusiveness. That's yeah, all. yeah. But I'm, what I'm saying is, is, you know, a, a lot of small business people, they have great ideas, and they, you know, when they go into the barbershop, they discuss the things that are going to hurt them as small business, and they talk about the things that you know we could that the government could actually do to maybe help small business. And a lot of times it's just getting out of the way, mm -hmm. you know, having some less less regulation and, you know, less less impediments to them actually getting done in their business mm -hmm. what they need to do. So that's that's kind of the focus of, of why I'm in this race. I want to get I want to get control back to the local communities because that's where the people are. Mm -hmm. And the, when the people have a can have control of their own destiny at the local community level, that's you know, you can replace those folks a lot easier than you can somebody at the state level. 
So I, I know. I know. The other thing too, I recognize is the fact that you served your country because the Army veteran and like almost like myself. I yes, mean, I did. I, you know. I from from 1981 to 1985, I was in the U.S. Army, and uh, I spent most of my time in West Germany with my wife. My two oldest kids were born over there, mm -hmm. so um, so they have kind of dual citizenship. They'd never been back, but I mean, if they if they wanted to, they could. Well, thanks um, for serving. Yeah, thank you thanks for, for serving, serving too, okay, brother. Good. Thank yeah. you, sir. Right. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's go. Why don't we just get right on in this deal, then? Okay. What are you hearing out there when you're knocking on those doors right now? Well, what, what are people? What, what are their concerns? I mean, you're knocking on these doors. And, you know, you've been knocking on the doors anyway as a realtor. You know, you've been mm -hmm. out there post. You know, <laughs> getting getting things together with real estate. But what are you hearing from people? Well, I think generally people are. They're a little bit afraid of it for their future as far as the direction the country's going and they are um like what specifically well, about it? Where the there's a lot going? of fear and a lot of anger i like, guess L like for instance um just that there's that they've they've lost control of their own destiny that, that they they can't find you know they can't find jobs that are that are what they need or are, are they just uh they're just frustrated sometimes because because the politicians aren't listening to them. It's just like in Salem right now. There's a lot of things that are happening to people, mm -hmm. and and there's a lot of people showing up to testify in these committees, and and I I think a, a lot of times a majority of of the testimony is is contrary to what the actual legislature does, mm -hmm. and so people are think, thinking, is it really does it really is it really worth going to talk to these folks if they're not going to listen? And, 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 that, and that's not just locally here, but when, when it comes to Eastern Oregon where they're having discussions about what to do in the different forests, you know, changing so you can't access the forests as much as you can, road closures and that kind of thing. People show, especially in the Blue Mountain, the Blue Mountain uh, area over there, you know, I've heard, I've heard that they, they're having testimony after testimony, and it's like they're just going through the motions mm -hmm. Just having this, having the testimony, so they can say that they had it, and, and then they're doing what they want to do anyway, and that's that fr that's, that's frustrating. Right. That's, what that's frustrating I, to people. Especially yeah. unhappy when you hear, well, they had already made up their mind, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though you testified, they had already made up your mind. Who yeah. wants to hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. know that mm -hmm. that's what's going to put the law to, together. Right. Right. So, right. so if they've already got their mm -hmm. their mind made up and they already have their agenda on what they're going to do. They're just going through the motions, Bruce, and I think that's the most frustrating to people, that, that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, mm -hmm. it, it's not that. It's mm -hmm. like, I've already decided what's, what's best for you, mm -hmm. Bruce, and, and we're going to have the meeting so we can document that we had the mm -hmm. public mm -hmm. hearing, mm -hmm. and then we're just going to ignore everything that was said and do what we want to do, and that, yeah. that's frustrating to mm -hmm. people. That's right. so, that's, that's right. so then, as governor, as governor, then how are you going to break that? What are you going to do? To, to make sure that it is getting to of the people, by the people, and for the people. What are you What are you going to do as governor? Well, I think we got to walk in without an agenda, okay. and actually listen to what the people say. You know, Ronald Reagan used to say, "You're never going to go wrong by listening to the people." Okay. Oh. You know, he okay. always would listen yeah. to the people, and and when when you, when you weren't sure uh, uh, the direction that you should go for a certain thing. Ask the people. So how Bruce? How is Bruce Cuff going to do that? To listen to them? Are you going to do it through uh, uh, maybe uh, calling the the media and and having a press conference on, uh, on a constant basis, maybe weekly, and say, hey, this is an issue that I'm a little concerned about, and then educate the people about what the issue is and and the impact it's going to have on us as a state and how it's going to benefit. Is that something that uh, you might entertain doing? Uh, yeah, as well, yeah. Well, there's two there's two ways to look at it. One 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 way is when you're gathering information, right? Right. And, and the press conferences are really for for saying you know saying hey we gathered this information and mm -hmm. we're putting it out to you and saying here's what we're thinking about doing mm -hmm. if you if you think differently let us know and but but you know the bar shops and beauty salons idea all across the state i mean if we if we have those set up to where we, we've got because you know the way we can communicate nowadays i mean you could have you yeah. could send out emails you can send out you can communicate very quickly okay. to, to all these folks and get feedback from them so um, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, there's got to be a way to get directly to the people to hear what they have to say about mm -hmm. a certain issue and, and not have to drag them to Salem all the time to testify in that one committee to hear exactly yeah. what that what mm -hmm. the people that show up. You know, there's a, there's a saying, if you don't show up, if you don't show up 
at the meeting, yeah. you're you're on the menu. Mm -hmm. You know, so so if they're having an issue and, and, and they're especially if they're looking to raise a certain tax and and, and they're having a meeting on, on doing that and your industry is not represented there to give your side, then you then that's probably gonna it's probably gonna impact you. Okay. okay. So um, so you know, press conferences are good to, 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 to indicate to the folks here's here's the issue, here's what I think is going on now. <clears throat> now let's get some feedback. Mm -hmm. And so but one of the things I'm seeing is when people already have their mind made up and they're not willing to listen, uh, it, 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 it's very our our whole system is so polarized right now, and 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 there's and the, this politically correct stuff where where you can, there's only one opinion that you can have, and if you have a different one, the tendency is to demonize the, the other folks or start the name calling. We have to stop that. We have to be able to talk to each other in a civil manner. And, and you know, and, and get back to that because if we don't, we're you know, our society is is not going to benefit. Well, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but yeah. then, but then as governor, at the same time, people are going to want to hear what how is this going to benefit me? I got a problem, and hopefully they're listening to what you're saying in regards. You've taken the problems that you're hearing, mm -hmm. and you're talking to, and then you get your group together and talk yep. about solutions. People That's are interested right. in solutions. How am I going to feed my family? You know, I mean, what mm -hmm. about the educating yeah. my kids? Well, what about law enforcement? All that kind of good and, stuff. And, and, and I understand people that, that you know, kind of have the idea that, you know, what's in it for me. But I think we got to look past that. And we have to say, okay, you know, if I just get mine and it hurts, it hurts another person, then that's not worth, that's not worth getting. That's a, that's a, that's a tough yeah. deal. You well, know. I know it is. But, but I mean, uh, you know, we, we have to look out for the other okay. guy. Right. We okay. have to be willing to look out for the other guy. And I think that's some of the times so what's we, lacking. How do we do that? We, we pay the taxes. Right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking out for some right if I pay my taxes. Right. Right. Well, well, I think we got to get back to where, as communities, we don't rely on the hired person to do everything. When we were in Germany, my wife and I were in Germany, they didn't have a lot of street sweepers. They didn't have a lot of people that cleaned up along the highway. I mean, the people would go out in front of their house and they would sweep the street in front of their house. And they oh. kept, you know, they kept their street clean. So many times nowadays in our society, we pay our taxes and then we, and then we just expect the professional to take care of it. Because we figure that's what, that's what we pay Well, for. I know, but for instance, right. the school, in the school system, yeah. right? I've heard a lot of people say, well, man, I pay my taxes. I sent my kid to the schools and they're not learning. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I've always looked at it like I'm the parent. It's my responsibility to make sure my, my children learn, right? It's, it's not the school's responsibility. It's my responsibility. So I think we have to take personal responsibility for our own families. Mm -hmm. And so when I sent my kids to school, uh, you know, I made sure they did their homework. I made sure that they were respectful to their teachers. I had a few times where my kids tried to tell me the teacher was doing this, the teacher was doing that. Well, I sat down with the teacher at the at the teacher's conference, and I had my son sit right there, and I said, okay, my son has said that you, you know, this, this, yeah, and this. Yeah. And the teacher said, well, you know what, Mr. Cuff, I expect your son to actually do his homework. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I looked at my son and I said, he will, you know. So, I mean, it's my responsibility yep. as a parent. So, but, so, so we, have to, we have to get back to that okay. where, you know, we take more responsibility on ourselves for our own families and for what we're doing there. We can't, we can't just look, you know, it's like Harney County over there. Yep. You know, the, the, the amount of costs that they, that they put in, well, it's not these rural counties where they have fires. Mm -hmm. It used to be when they'd have a fire, all hands on deck, all the farmers, all the local community, man, they went out, they fought the fire. Nowadays, we have the professionals do that. So, cause, so, so, so it's a lot more expensive. And so when you talk to these counties about, about getting this land to where they're actually managed, they say, well, we can't afford to do that. Well, that's because we've, you know, we've hired it out now and it's way more expensive. We need to get back to where we're, as communities, we're taking care of our, our Looking out for the other guy in our community, and also looking out well, you know, for our families. We, that's why we have you here. That's right. Because you're not a politician. No. And that's what we talk about. We don't need <laughs> politicians now. right now. We, no. We need people that will be able to react to those folks that are that are basically doing that now because they don't care. Because yeah. they say, "Gee, I pay my taxes. This guy didn't pay his rent. <laughs> yeah. I'm paying my rent, and you know, and the things not getting done or the education system. I pay. I pay my 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 bill, my taxes for the school system, and then. Uh, they don't. They tell me they're going to educate my kid at the end of the day, but they, and they tell me, say, well, look, you come to the school board meeting, and we're going to tell you how we're going to do it, 
and the, and the kid is still flunking out of school. Yeah. See, so that's why we have you here now today to talk about this, to get the word out, right? Yeah, that's you right. Me? That's okay. right. Okay. Well, let, let's, let's shift for a moment. Uh, you know, last time you were here, we talked about Burns and all that issue right. and whatever. Uh, would you just do a little briefy update in terms of how it, how it started at the beginning, which just for the benefit of the new folks, and then, um, uh, then get into give us an update of where it is today. Okay. Well, um, what, what brought the, the folks to, to Burns was the fact that uh, uh, Steve and Dwight Hammond, who had, uh, they were accused of arson okay. uh, for burning uh, 139 acres of, uh, of BLM land, which is f uh, considered federal land. And, uh, you know, Greg Walden on the floor of the house, I mean, he, he gave, he gave it uh, a, 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 a Elect, elected congressman. Yeah, right? our elect, our elected, leaders? elected leaders from that leaders, area. I mean, yeah. he, he talked to the House, and he just he spoke about how frustrating it is for the ranchers dealing with the, the, the BLM because there is some abuse going on. And, and they're, you know, they're changing the rules on the, all the time, restricting, you know, when, when we're talking about rights, property rights, as a realtor, we have, we, you know, I understand property rights. You also have water rights and you have grazing rights. And a lot of time these grazing rights that these ranchers have had, they, they predate some of the legislation that has been passed um, in the 30s that had to do with establishing BLM and, and actually uh, starting to manage these federal lands. Well, their, their grazing rights go way back before then. So when the BLM shows up and says, you know, we're from the government and we're here to help you, Okay, you've heard that. Well, that that that's always scary. Mm -hmm. So what's happened over the course of time is they've got more and more restrictive. They 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 don't allow. They they make them run less and less cattle on the same land, even though they had the right to do it before. The fees go up all the time. So these ranchers are, you know, their livelihoods are on the line. If if the BLM says you can't run, you you can only run 50 head of cattle on that piece of property instead of 100. Well, you just cut that guy's income in half. In, in essence, so so what happened over there was there there's this struggle going on, and um, in the 90s the Hammonds they were trying to restrict them from a water right. The the BLM was by they actually tried to gate a county road. It was a county road, not a federal road, so couldn't do that. So in the state they took them to court, and the state actually sided with the Hammonds and made sure that the feds got out of the way and let them access that water right because okay. that was a right. Okay. So anyway, um, over the course of time. Uh, one of the normal practices on the ranching is 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 burning some of the scrub brush off so that you you know so the grasses come back. Well, there was a, there was a couple fire. First fire they set was kind of to get rid of that scrub brush. The second fire that they set that they were charged with was um, actually a back burn because there was a lightning strike that was burning toward their yeah. winter crop. So they okay. set a back fire and okay. that burned up against it and put the fire out. And they were charged with arson. And oh, this is always my question. Okay, you get charged with arson. I don't know any arsonists that actually put the fires out. Because they put both these fires out. I mean, they started them to burn them, and then they put them out. So arsonists, you know, they usually throw the, throw the match and run. You know, they're not, you know. So these guys were doing normal ranching practices. But because the BLM, they really want their ranch is what they're after. Mm -hmm. They want to add that to the Malheur National uh, Wildlife Refuge over there. And, and it's really apparent in this whole case because part of their settlement was uh, that they had to agree to give the BLM the first right of refusal on their ranch. And, and they, they fined them $400,000. For burning that 100 acres. For burning that 139 did, did, acres. Did they, did they replace the, the, the grass? And well, the, the, the U.S. attorney, he charged them under the, under the terrorist statute, and, the, and, and that has a minimum sentence of five years, maximum sentence of death. Mm -hmm. If he'd used the BLM statute, the maximum sentence would have been a year. Mm -hmm. So he didn't use that. He used the other one. But when the judge got, after the jury had found them guilty of these two cases, and the jury wasn't really aware of what they, how long they could really go to jail, the judge right. didn't really explain that to him. And the judge used the term um, that a five-year sentence, this is a legal term that I, that I read, 
it, it shocks the conscience, is what the judge said. That's why he changed the, the, the law that they were being charged under. The judge said, this shocks the conscience to think that they're going to burn 100 bucks worth of scrub brush and they're going to go to jail for five years. So the, so the judge refused to send them to jail for five years. He sent Dwight Hammond to jail for three months and he sent Steve Hammond to jail for a year. Okay. And that was the maximum sentence under the BLM statute. So he kind of on his own. And the reason he did that is he used that term. That it shock it'd be cruel and unusual punishment and it shocks the conscience. That's what the judge said in the ruling. So they went to jail. Okay? They served their time in jail and they got back out. Now if the Fed if the if the US Attorney's Office had had disagreed with that decision, it looks like when these guys were in jail, they would have went back to the ninth to the ninth uh, Circuit court, and they would have said, no, they need to stay for five years. Well, they didn't do that. They waited till they actually got out, and they were actually out for a year before they, they did that. So now, this January, they had to go back to jail for five years, and they agreed to do that. They had another judge then, though, right? Well, the, it, was, it, was a, judge. It, it was appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court, oh, okay, okay. okay is, is what happened. So, um, But one of the things that was interesting, in the whole decision, the Hammonds had to agree not to appeal. When they when they got their their sentence, they had to say, "I'm not going to appeal." So oh, the, Hammond, the Hammond had to agree but, but, that they but, weren't, but the U.S. Attorney's the Office said, did. You know, the they said did. They were, yeah, appeal. yeah. So and that was part of the settlement. So anyway, so the Hammonds were supposed to report to jail January fourth, I think, second or fourth, something like that, this year. So the the Bundy showed up. The Bundy and their group showed up about the middle of October. And they started working with the people and saying and going to the sheriff and saying, look, this is double jeopardy. These guys are being sentenced. You need to protect them. Okay. And um, so and that's kind of where it started. But the Bundys met with the Hammonds. And what happened was um, the Hammonds, uh, about the middle of, of November, the Hammonds were contacted by the U.S. Attorney's Office and, and basically said, you need to stop talking to the Bundys. Because if you if you don't stop talking to the Bundys, we're going to send you back to jail early, and we're going to send you to a less desirable prison. What does it sound like to you? That's intimidation in my book. So so they got afraid. So they they backed off from the Bundys, and that's why they kind of distanced themselves from the Bundys, and they said, "Look, we're just going to go back to jail, you know, and, and it's over." And it's over. So what the protests that they had right before the Hammonds went back to jail, that's what they everybody saw in Burns where they had 300 people that was marching around town. They met with the Hammonds briefly. And then right after that's where the, where um, Bundy and his group took over the mouth here. And of course, you know, when we were meeting, when we were having our meeting on the 10th, that Wednesday night, um, they were actually surrounding that, uh, that compound at the time. So and that's kind of where we were. Uh, when we met the last time. So since then, um, Franklin Graham showed up, which is Billy Graham's son. Yeah. He came, and a uh, congressman from uh, Nevada, Michelle Farine. Farine. Yeah, she came. Yeah, oh, she cool came. Person. Yeah, so so she came, and she she's she's has represented. Anyway, she was able to get those last four guys to give theirself up, and you know, kind of end what it without what about anybody. Our Oregon getting. delegation? Did they come? No. Why? They. Good question, Bruce. That's yeah, that's right. the question. That's the million dollar question. Our 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 uh, our senator um, Ron Wyden, uh, you know, he made the he made the statement that uh, you know we had to stop this before the virus spreads. So we have a we have a in, in essence a, it's a protest. You can you can uh, you know some people say well you know they had a legitimate complaint they just shouldn't have done what they did. You know what they did was illegal. They took over that uh, federal. A facility, and I, I think the guys that did it, I think especially Eamon Bundy, I think he knew that he was breaking the law, and he was probably going to go to jail for it. Mm. But that's the price he's willing to pay because yeah. he's trying to he's trying to make a statement that these federal lands, the, con the Constitution does not give the federal government the right to manage these lands. These lands should be have been given to the states, and they should be managed by the county for the for the. We're talking about of the people, by the people, for the people. They should be managed for the people's benefit in at each individual county in this state, mm -hmm. instead of instead of having it being managed from the federal level. That's okay. not that's not. 
this. And that's what they're saying, that okay. the, that this, the uh, Constitution doesn't allow for that. First right of refusal really sounds phony. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they're trying to do eminent domain for mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Is that right? I mean, if they're... Well, the, we want a first right the, the federal government has been seizing land through, you know, they just, I just read where they, you know, there's three new monuments in California. Whenever they put a national monument into place, it restricts the ranching. The guys that have the grazing rights that we're talking about that go back, you know, way before, mm. all of a sudden when they just de determine that this piece of property is going to be a national monument, there's all kind of restrictions that go on that. And all of a sudden, these rights that these farmers and ranchers used to have on this property are, are diminished, mm. or if not gone. Mm. Right now in Malheur County, the county next door to Harney County, um, the federal government is looking at seizing 2.5 million acres there to make a, 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 a national monument there. And the people of Malheur County I saw there's going to be a ballot that goes out where they, uh, kind of an opinion ballot. Would you be in favor of this or against yeah, this? Yeah. And and so, but uh, but so so that's that's how the federal government has taken this land. Is it they, they kind of designated as a protected national monument, and then the rights that were there beforehand. Well, correct these are me property if I, rights. Correct me if I'm wrong. Whenever. But it's my understanding, what, 50% of Oregon is, 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 uh, is basically government land or public land? Well, 53% is federal, federal, federal yeah. government. Federal land? Federal, okay. yeah. There's, there's, I mean, the state owns uh, uh, portions of the land in the state, too. But the federal controlled Portion. manage is 53%. Okay. Which, right. is public land. Which is public land. Which is public land. Yeah, public land. And, and there wouldn't mm -hmm. be a change in status going from federally public land to to state public land yeah. that allowed the counties to actually manage it. That okay. there wouldn't be a change in status. Okay. It's still public land. It's just yeah. it's just a matter of how much it, how much it's going to cost you. The fed the federal um, you know I saw a study where the every dollar they spend the federal government spends to manage the land they make seventy three cents. Mm -hmm. Every dollar that the state spend to manage the land that's under their jurisdiction they make an average of fourteen dollars. So mm -hmm. they're actually making money. When they're managing federal lands, and the and the federal government's losing money, and it's supposed to go back in the, in the public, and it goes back property. to the benefit of the people. And then, and then right up front, where the people don't know where it's going, and we don't have any representation, and we've elected folks we just, to basically do that. For we just us. have to keep getting out our wallet and, and paying for but it. That's the frustration, <laughs> Bruce, and that that's the frustration that people are going that's through right. right now. And we need to make sure that we understand who our leadership's going to be, and that's why this is a very, very important election you across bet. anything that we're that we're considering today. Okay, yeah. what we're going to do? We're going to take a short break. We're going to go on and take a short break, and we'll come back and visit with Bruce a little bit more and spend a little bit more time in the legislature. We, we had a special session and, and see what he's gotten out of that deal. Okay, we'll take a short break, and we'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Let's go. Okay. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, and uh, Richard is here with me, Richard Carpenter, and and uh, we're, we're 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 basically meeting with um, a person who is not a politician more, but. 
but that frustration part of it, and he basically mm -hmm. got into this election, and he's running for governor of the state of Oregon. He's got some good credentials, too, folks. One of the credentials he had, one, he's a, he's a veteran. He served his country. I think that's a very important one. And secondly, he's a, he's a guy that's out there on the street knocking on doors because he's in the real estate business. And you get to know folks, and he's mentioned about the fact that he, he's visited every barber shop and, and, uh, and, and was it uh, another salon, the, the beauty, beauty salon. shop in the, in the whole state of Oregon, right? You covered every one of them. Nail shop. You, you knocked know, out nail every, shops. You did all of those. Tanning guy, salons. Yeah, and, gee, why we even <laughs> well, have not, a, not everyone. I, I did well, rural well, Oregon last two get, years ago. I was just a lot of rural. Bruce, we don't even need to have an election. You already know all the people. Well. <laughs> We're <laughs> Oregon. I, I I didn't do the valley. Yet. Oh, you I done, the valley done a lot of. That's okay, what I'm doing good. this time. All right, I'm, all right. I've got right. to do that this time. But no, but no due respect. Um, these are very serious times. This is our first show that we're going to really get involved in. Just we're going to do basically. Rich and I are going to be doing the same thing with a lot of other folks. We're going to be basically talking to to these folks who are saying that they are inspiring to be our leaders. But we want to make sure they understand what that leadership means. That's right. It doesn't mean pocketing the money for themselves. You got right, me? Right. Or just going for special interests. We want them to represent the people, including the special interests. Okay. Represent everybody for that matter, because yeah. we all live here, you know. And, right. and, and, and the thing that bothers me right now, especially now today, we got, they, thought they figured about, we've got 300 million here in, the, in these United States. And then, uh, let's see, the China has something like oh, yeah. 1.2 billion people. That's right. They least. got 1 billion people more than we have, and, you know, that's some pretty heavy stuff. You know what I'm saying? Beforehand, it was maybe when the issue, because we had all of the goodies. Same with India. Yeah, with India, the same boat. So it's very, very important that we pick the right leadership this time around, mm -hmm. okay? And not to say that those other folks can run too, but, you know, the bottom line, they need to understand that they're going to be representing the people, a government of the people, by the people, and that's for right. the people. And when you get up there, that's what you do. So we've been talking about Burns, and we've talked about a lot of things, and it's just been really great. And so what we want to do now is that we've got a special session and I'm sure you probably a little bit, you, well, you'd have to be aware if, in fact, you're going to be governor of the state of Oregon because you'd be the one that's basically the leadership and putting that piece together. Right. So we want you to give us a little feedback of, give us an update on what's happening in that legislature. It looked like people were demonstrating there the other day. I didn't know what was yeah. going on. Y yeah. People yelling and the yelling and going on. I mean, how, would, would you uh, would you have allowed that to happen, or would, would you have called the national guard out? Uh, well, Bruce, uh, the, what's the deal? The, well, the state police were there, and they weren't quite sure what to do with these folks. What to do? Uh, because they, you know, they wanted to allow the protest, but they didn't want to, them to allow to damage, you know, the, the 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 structure or or cause disruption where the 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 house representatives couldn't carry on their business, and wow. so. You know, when they took their shoes off and started whacking on the walls wow. and, and uh, you know, did a set, sit in where people couldn't get through the what? hallway. I mean, what would Bruce have done? What would Bruce have done? I well, know what I would have done, I, but what would Bruce have done? You know, I, I, on something like that, I mean, I, I, you know, they, they, you they, they did a lot of things that they weren't really supposed to do. They, they had banners in there that they weren't supposed to bring in. So would you um, have walked out there and talked to them and say, hey, look, you're, you're disturbing the people. I, I'm the governor of the state well, of Oregon. It seemed like this the, is my house, and I'm representing the people. And, in arms. Well, uh, call yeah. your National Guard up there. Uh, what, would, what would Bruce have done? Well, you know, with when, when people become unruly like that, I mean, you know, you, you don't you, you don't want you, you still want to allow for for public protest. I mean that I mean, you, and we need to listen to to what people are saying. But you know, you we, we, them, but we, but we, That's we, the we people's we, house, you know. Yeah, but we need to we need to let people know that hey, look, you know, if you're if you're going to protest, you need to do it in a, in a civil manner, you know. We, yeah. But but the thing is, run for office like well, you. Yeah, but the thing is, I think they need to know that they're heard. If we just ignore them or try to shut them down, I mean that that's not that. I mean they need to know that that they're heard and and, and their concerns are being met. And of course, the, the what was. Uh, what they what they were protesting the group the the 15 now I mean they, they want they're probably going to have on the ballot in November okay uh, a, a, a minimum where the minimum wage goes to fifteen dollars right now that's that's not what the legislature is voting on they they were voting on on uh, a ramp up in the you know to to yeah. uh, to a higher wage and, and of course now, what the, does that mean? I mean okay, well first it was fifteen dollars, right? They yeah, wanted the fifteen. Yeah, and so the, the well up, the business what community mean? and and whatnot that, that, that they discussed with and, and the compromise that, that they're kind of talking about uh, was that they had three different the three different areas. The Portland area was gonna be fourteen go up to fourteen seventy five an hour the uh, the valley and um, a couple counties in the south were Medford and Ashland are the 
the the counties that are um, that have the metropolitan type areas in it. Yeah. The, those are going to be thirteen fifty an hour eventually, yeah. and then the rest of the state, more rural sections, are going to be twelve fifty. So they divided the states up into three different areas. Why did they do that? Well, it costs more to live here. I mean that that's well, the does? that's the thinking, but I but think so. but there again, if you raise the if you raise the minimum wage, you're just going to drive costs up more. So I, I don't know. I I think I think that the answer, in, in my opinion, is the direction we're heading is is running business out of the state with you know raising business taxes and and raising the minimum wage. You know what we should be doing is doing everything we can to get. Get our economy going and have a, uh, and get make businesses in our state so that being in Oregon is the place to do business. Uh, cutting business taxes, cutting as much regulation as we can, encouraging businesses to be here, because if businesses locate here and we have more and more business in this state, uh, and, and we have so much business that. Uh, they have to bid for workers because there's not enough workers to go around, wages will go up. To arbitrarily put on business a higher wage that drives the cost of living up and also makes it so that businesses move out of the state, it's a supply and demand thing. Mm. You drive business out of the state, uh, you know, the, that's really gonna hurt a lot of small businesses. And, you know, they're talking about raising the, the business taxes in the state by 250%, going from from one mm. billion dollars every two years to three point five billion dollars every two years, that that that's two hundred fifty percent increase. There's not a business in the state that is is going to be happy about that, and and it's targeted at the major businesses, the big businesses, the Intels, the Nikes, the big the big guys. You know, if, if the taxes get too out of whack, they're going to go somewhere else. You know, and counties. And cities that work to attract business, if you ever look at the packages that they give these businesses to bring them here, they cut their taxes. They, you know, they, do, they cut some regulation. They do everything they can to attract that business. Well, that should be kind of an ongoing, normal thing. Because basically, that, when you do that for one business and you don't do that for all businesses, that's kind of like welfare for the businesses. Yeah, See? Well, and, unfortunately, and, that's what they're doing Well, now. I know, but, but, but if, if, we, if we leveled the playing field and said, you know, let's cut back on, on business taxes and, and made, made it so that this is the place to be for business, then, you know, we'd, mm -hmm. if we have a lot of a business and they're bidding for workers, that's going to naturally bring the price up for labor. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, the so way it's we're a, it's going... A, it's an issue. The way we're going is... A, Exact yeah, opposite yeah. way. That we well, now you're running for governor, and uh, I just happen to know the, um, the the leading proponent on the other side. His name is Jamie Partridge. He's from this area. Mm -hmm. Came is from me. I interviewed. Yeah, him. I, I, I saw there. Jamie on the yeah. video. Yeah, so, yeah, in fact, yeah. Uh, what, I saw him on your show yeah, too. Good. I saw so some of that. maybe I can have both of you on the show. There you go. And then you I'd love to talk to him. Deal, and he kept up his rationale. Yeah. Maybe we, we got to talk to each other, Bruce. That's right. We, the public, Richard and I, are going to learn something. Because at the end of the day, we're going to know who we're going to vote for. You know what I'm saying? Right? Is that is that fair? Yeah, I'll get in touch with Jamie, and then we'll put that piece together. Sounds I think good. It's a very important piece. Sounds good. Now another piece, and I'm just throwing this out to you, not just kind of just throwing things on the table, but you know, marijuana came to our town. You know, we we had Washington on one side. Well, it started up in Arizona. We had Washington on one side. We had California on the other side. We're sitting right in the middle. I mean, boy, this was really the city of roses at one point in time. We, <laughs> Oregon is beautiful, green, and everything. I mean, the, the flowers are dying all over the place. I mean, it just, I mean, things are happening in this area. We, we want to, Keep things nice and beautiful in Oregon, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but um, uh, what do you think about that? Anything uh, on on the whole marijuana issue thing? Well, no one wants to talk about it, but I think it's good to do. You know, yeah, I'm because sorry. we are going through some changes. I mean, you know, as far as I'm concerned, a majority will be. Hey, that's the way I that's the way I live with it. You know, if if the if the majority of the people say, hey, it's going to go this way, and I vote it the other way, hey, at the end of the day, that's the way it is. Yeah, but I should be giving that to you. So, what do you think about that? Okay. Well, the I mean, I wasn't in favor of, of legalizing marijuana. I mean, I, I kind of wanted to leave it with the, yeah. the medical thing. And I've, you know, and I've, and I've talked to a number of people that are, um, you know, medical users and, you know, and, and I, I, I can understand some of that, you know, and uh, use of it, but the, the recreational use, I don't know. I, I, in my own, in my own family, I, you know, even before it was legal, I mean, I, I just saw the, the lack of initiative, yeah. you know, people that some of the people that just like uh, stole their life from them. So I, 
and and of course I, I was I worked for a company called uh, uh, Superior Tire Service for 15 years, and they they did a lot of work with like Warehouser and and some of the lumber companies, and they have a drug free policy, and we could not get as a business we could not actually without having a drug free policy at Superior Tire Service where we had a drug testing policy where. Um, you know, if we had an act, somebody gets in an accident, they're immediately drug tested. We had a random testing of drugs for our employees. Well, now what? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they're, they're, by by using, a lot of folks are going to put themselves out out of uh, out of those kind of businesses, and th those were some of the better paying jobs. Uh, a lot of the tire service guys made pretty good money. So, um, you know, I. If you choose to use, I mean, there's going to be restrictions on your life. I mean, it's a free country, and you know we we've got it now where uh, it's it's recreational use is legal in Oregon. Um, I'm just not sure as a society, long term, that that's going to be beneficial mm -hmm. for us. Now, it's my know. understanding. It's my understanding. Okay, the, the, it passed. Okay, yep. that's that's the, right. that's the law of the land. It did pass. But understand there might be some options that we have, I mean, from the standpoint of saying we have the option, if you will, to adjust it depending upon the areas we're in. People are meeting and basically talking about how much you can sell, where you can sell, and all these kinds of things. And, and so we're still in the discussion. It's not like as if to say this, you can just do anything mm -hmm. you want to do. Right, So, right. Uh, And I'm saying that, again, you being governor and whatever, would, be, would you be the kind of a person that said, okay, fine, I want to put all these issues on the table now and, and see whether or not we can make these adjustments with, with at the same time abiding by the law, right? Well, what do you think? Well, uh, I, and I, I, think, I think there again, I mean, I think the local communities should be able to make, make up their Maybe minds whether they, right. whether they, you know, want to have it in their community or not in their community. And, you know, statewide we took a vote, you know, why not let our communities take a vote? Okay. County by county, if they want to take a vote county by county and say, you know, there are cities, you know, Monmouth, the city of Monmouth there years ago, they were, they had, there were no alcohol sales in the city of Monmouth. So it was a, it was a dry city, you know, and Independence mm -hmm. was next door and they had probably twice as many bars in Independence, but they had no, no, none. In, so, I mean, you know, it, it, I think, I think get back to local control, you know, let, let counties and cities determine, you know, what, what they want to have within their jurisdiction. And, you know, if it's okay statewide to live by, you know, here's the vote, let's do it. Why can't local communities do that? Why can't a county decide, look, we, 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 we don't, I mean, I mean you know, I, I don't, it'd be pretty tough to restrict the, the, gr the growing of it there because Oregon has made it legal to grow under certain circumstances. But as far as selling it in that county, I, 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 I would err on, on the, you know, we're talking about we the people Mm. And let, let we, the people in each individual uh, jurisdiction, decide what they want to do. Well, maybe that might be a, a thought because when you think about the wages, if they gave, they gave different levels in, in terms of uh, what, right. the, what the raise is going to be, maybe they'll give different levels in terms of uh, how much you can buy in one area and you can, uh, well, uh, how much it costs and, well, and get see, a little bit more rent. And see, I guess, I, guess, right? I, guess, I guess what bothers me about the three different levels is that yeah. it's just arbitrary and put upon people, and it's not, it's not based on a... A supply and demand, or or any kind of economics, it's just right. put out there on them, because because Big Brother, the state says so, and here's yeah. what we're passing. This is what you're getting. But they're voting that, on that. We got leaders there that are voting well, on this stuff. I, I, mean, I understand I, that. Did they but, agree to this stuff? I mean, they're in session. Yeah, and the people well, from that sign, area. The governor to sign. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the governor, you're the governor. Now. I mean, I want you. Yeah. Can't you intervene and say, no, I'm gonna veto this stuff? Or, well, I would. I probably would if okay, I was governor. Right, okay, I okay. probably would have vetoed okay. that. But but. Um, the the thing is though um, the the whole idea that uh, we should have three different arbitrary numbers um, that 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 to me it, it, it strikes of you know we we know what's best for you but but here's the thing that bothers me about yeah. this if we're gonna do this and we're gonna have this discussion the and you, you mentioned special session. This isn't really a special session. It's considered an annual session now. The, the legislature actually changed the law to where this isn't a special session. It's actually the annual You're session do this every, now. Every year now. And it's 35 days. Oh. And what the, what when they when they sold this idea to the Oregonians, they said during this 35 day session, right. all we're going to deal with is budgetary issues. 
and we're going to take care of just the budgetary tweaks, and then we're going to get out of town. Mm -hmm. We are not going to deal with substantive issues. Mm -hmm. Now, what is going on down there? But as governor, if you were as governor, no, but would, Bruce, you, would you vote okay that? No. Would you, would you, would you okay that? Well, I, I, I think that the, the, powers that are, the, the powers that be right now, the Democrats who are in control right mm -hmm. now of the, governor's race, of the governors and the legislature, um, they've made a decision that to me they're breaking faith with the people of Oregon because they they told us when they when they put this annual session in place that it was only going to focus on budget small budgetary issues okay. there's not enough time to really vet anything so we're just going to take care of business and get out of town this session they have not done that they have in fact they were having meetings in January before the session started in February talking about bills that didn't even exist yet legally mm. They were having meetings on bills that weren't going to be introduced until February. They spent the whole month meeting in preparation for the 35-day session. That I mean, how can you have meetings on bills that don't legally exist yet? But as governor, how would you handle it? My point is that you I, have to sign I, off on it, right? You yeah. represent Oregon. Would you have signed off on this stuff and and then maybe maybe change? Maybe well, I, I, I would have said, look, stick to what stick to what your agreement was. And of course, of course, the the response is, well, there's nothing in statute that requires us to do that. Yeah. You know, to me, that's breaking faith. That's breaking yeah, faith. That's important. That, I mean, if you say you're going to do something, you need you need to follow through. You can't say, well, you know what, we're in control and we can do this, so we're just going to cram this through. That's well, not talking to each other. That's okay. not that's not let's working. Let's say, as governor, how would you have handled? It? What would you have get thrown on the table to deal with the fact that we've got issues we need to discuss and we need to be meeting on an annual basis? Well. What, what would be your argument? What would be your position? I would have liked to stay with the way we had it. Where we was? just had one, we had one session every two years. Okay. And if we actually had some issue that came up, then we'd have a special session. We we wouldn't necessarily have to need an annual session. And the reason the reason I say that yeah. is because this is exactly what a lot of people said was going to happen. Is that you, they weren't going to limit it. They weren't. They, they weren't telling you the truth to begin with, and this session right here proves the, the fact that they were right, that they're not just going to limit it to just budget issues and then get out of town. When you have a 35-day session and you talk about substantive issues and you're trying to get that done, it looks like to me that you're limiting public debate and you're just cramming as much stuff through as you can to, you know, to get your agenda accomplished, and, and you're really not concerned with um, you know, t doing what the people actually said that special interests. Yeah. You're basically yeah. you're basically using the session to let certain special interests get their agenda through, and you're not limited. You're not listening to we the people out there that says that say, look, I don't got time to come to Salem right now, and and there was a lot of folks that came to Salem and, and from Eastern Oregon that spoke in these committees on this bill. And they did it anyway. Hmm. So people are wondering, okay, so does it do any good to go to testify to these committees if they've already got their mind made up? Yeah. That's that's I think that's the frustration and anger that's out there is they already have their mind made up. They're going to do it anyway, and you show up and testify, and you you know, and you uh, you know, and you don't do it with a pound and all, with your shoe on the wall. You're actually you know you're trying to be civil. You you, you give them written statements. You you make your case. But yet, the, but yet they don't listen, and they do it anyway. That's frustrating. Yeah, That's that yeah. makes people angry. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. well, boy, I tell you, 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 this is quite a task here. I mean, are you going to be up to you? You still feeling comfortable? About oh running, yes, running for governor. Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's well, got to change like the that. direction that well, that's, we're, that's, that's we're where going. We are. That's where yeah. we are at this point in time. Okay. What right. else is on your mind about but, running for governor? Well, or, or maybe I should ask this. Maybe I should ahead. ask you this question. Of uh, what what was the issue that drove you to saying, "Hey, I'm going to file to run for governor"? What what top issue that you can say, and at the same time, give give, give us the rationale for that issue that you feel was the thing that got you to file to run for the governorship of Oregon. What was that issue? Well, um, one of, one of the major issues to me is you know I mean I had I had. I've got granddaughters now. They're going to be going into the school system, and uh, we we raised four children, and and uh, we pretty much our our older kids, we are all of our kids. We homeschooled them through about the fourth or fifth grade because we wanted to make sure they had a good solid grounding 
on who they were before they, they got into the school system because right now um, our, our society is so polarized and we have uh, the politically correct thing that you can believe and it's taught in the school system and, and I'm a Christian and if, if I disagree with w what's being taught in the school system I, I don't really I, I can't really I can't really change that you know and I, and I don't think I don't think everybody should have the same opinion but I think that 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 there should be allow there should there should be allowance for folks that don't all think the same and I'm not seeing that in our society I'm I'm seeing one narrative and if we differ from that you know we're suspect or or, or we're not uh, getting along so the, the issue that drove me is let's get some let's 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 get rid of this monopoly of public instruction and let par put parents back in control we're talking about local control parents back in control of of the money for we, we agree as a society we're going to fund schools okay well let let's give parents some kind of control okay i've got my kid he's going to school there's a certain amount of money the state is spending for my child to go to school if i don't want to send him to that public school because it doesn't it's it's not along the lines of the values that I have, and I want to and I want to send my kid to a Christian school, or I want to send my kid to a vocational type school, or I want to send my kid to a, a you know, something more directed to, along to the, my values. Let me do that. Right now, we can't do that. I mean, unless you're going to homeschool them, or 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 you're going to pay twice. If you're going to send your kid to a private school, you're paying twice. You're paying your taxes support the public system and then you're paying again to send your kid to a private school that is just a that is just not fair that is not a fairness to me it's a fairness issue if if everybody sub, if we agree as a society we're going to fund schools then let's do it in such a way that okay i'm we're going to fund the schools but ultimately the person that is in charge of their children's education is the parent hmm. they should be able to decide where my kids go to school that's probably the main issue that that has that driven is my huge. thinking is it look this and you know mm. we look at Oregon okay. right now where is it the graduation rate yeah it's it's, it's, it's the bottom cool. of the barrel yeah well you know so, I, I think, giving your thoughts there I'm thinking about um, former Governor uh, Kitzhopper John Kitzhopper remember uh, he basically pulled uh, basically repealed the whole issue about the superintendent being elected uh, for the entire state and he basically brought it under the under the house of the governor. Right, and then he put his committee together, and he had, he had, he appointed his czar. So in essence, he was actually the the state superintendent of education. Yeah, he had an administrator there for that aspect of it. What did you think about that when he changed it? Well, Cause that's I, where it's at right now. I know, and see that there again, you know, for thirty years, the way I look at it, for thirty years, we've just been consolidating power in the state. Okay. We've been consolidating the power. The whole idea of, get, of, of me getting in this race is let's take that power that we consolidate to the state, both tax money and how we raise taxes, and, and start to where we're actually raising those taxes and staying in the communities. And the communities have more money at the county level to do what they need to do that the state doesn't have their fingers on. We need to get back to local control. So that's, that's, where, I'm, that's where I'm focused on. Okay. Let's, and, and it goes with the schools, too. We, you know, the, the schools should be run locally. Okay. You know, okay. and funded locally. Okay. Well, it looks like we can talk a little bit more about that piece, but we're, we're getting we're running out of time okay. at this point in time. Anything, any lasting comments that you'd want to say to the public, to well, the voting public out there? Why should they vote for Bruce? Well, um, let them know. Let them know why, why they should vote for Bruce. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I, I just believe that, there, that we can do better as Oregonians and or as Oregonians, and we need to be able to talk to each other and listen to each other. And um, you know, uh, with the short time I have left, I'll just my website is www.timeforcuff.org, mm -hmm. and that's time, the number four, cuff c u f f dot org. And uh, you know, the the say the my slogan is enough is enough. It's time for Bruce Cuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that that's a slogan. And like I said, if you want if you want to see your communities thrive, and you want to see businesses thrive in this state, and, and a changing of the tax structure where we're business friendly, and we can see wages go up by being business friendly instead of the opposite, because we're doing the exact opposite. Then then vote for Bruce Cuff. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I tell you what, uh, Bruce, we, we really appreciate the fact that you you came on board and 
and you shared your thoughts and your feelings and and I think we learned a lot. What do you think, Rich? That's okay. Right. Sounds good. That's right. Well, hey, we want to thank you for being with us. And uh, again, like I said, look forward to being on Richard's show and being the Voters Digest. We're going to really try to get as many of these people who are running for leadership. Very, very important. And please get out and vote. If you have, if you haven't registered to vote, please get out there and register to vote. We again, want to thank th you. Thank the crew. And thanks yeah. the crew. Thank the crew. Thanks for everybody thank that's you here. Thank you very much. No, thanks, Kay, for taking some shots. We appreciate that. She's a good person. And everybody on. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Have a good one.